written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may what? Yes. Know you have eternal life. You already know. Amen? And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. What do you know for sure? Where we're going to wrap this your little epistle up tonight. And if the Lord doesn't come back for us between now and 7 o'clock. We're going to wrap this up tonight and uh, move on to something else uh, for the following uh, weeks. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessed word. Father, we are thankful tonight. Lord, we're thankful for the knowledge that you give us. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit, his indwelling presence, Lord, that gives us the assurance that we know these things. And Father, we can have confidence. Lord, for that, we're thankful tonight. I pray, Lord, if there's one here tonight that does not have confidence, that they're sure. Lord, that you would speak to that heart. Father, turn the light on. The light on hearts and minds, I pray tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Let's read uh, verse 14. Down through the rest of the chapter here. He said, and this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and if we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not to death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come, and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, on Jesus Christ. This is the true God, and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Well, one of the first things here that I'm going to give you... Which have
before chosen you and ordained as such by John uh, in his ministry with Christ. And he writes them here in his little epistle of 1 John. And these are the basis, these things, these statements and the teachings that he heard from Christ are the basis of why he has so much confidence in prayer uh, that he writes about here in this epistle. You know, for a lot of Christians, pr prayer is kind of an experiment. There's a lot of uncertainty about it that some folks have. And sometimes we pray because we don't know what else to do, right? That's why we pray. We uh, sometimes look at prayer as a last resort. Well, everything else has failed, I guess i got to pray, right? That's what we do. Nothing else to do left but to pray, and, and we consider it a last resort when really it ought to be our first resort, amen? It ought to be the first resort. Um, but according to John here, prayer is certainly not a, a um, it's not an uncertainty. It should be a sure thing. We know that he hears us, it says there in verse uh, 15. So it's not an experiment. It's not an experiment. He knows it works. And we can have confidence and boldness if we ask anything, but there is a condition. Amen? There's a condition. If we ask according to his will, right? If we ask according to his will, he hears us. God delights in bold praying. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, he talks about our high priest, right? Uh, and, and because of the high priest that we have in Jesus Christ, we can come boldly before his throne of grace, right? Saying that we can obtain help in time of need. Come boldly before the throne of grace. We have boldness to enter, uh, in Hebrews 10, we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way. So this is what ought to characterize our prayer. We ought to be able to come to God in prayer in, with a sense of confidence and a sense of boldness, right? But if you're asking according to His will, if you're asking according to His will, that qualification is always there. We must pray according to His will. What does that tell us? Well, I would say this. Perhaps the reason that many of our prayers we might consider unheard or maybe we don't see answers is because we're not praying according to his will. That's logical, right? We're not praying according to his will. He makes it clear here that a prayer according to God's will is heard. And that, by the way, destroys the concept that prayer is a, should be looked at as a means of getting God to do your will. It's not a means of getting God to do our will. Right? It's a means of us conforming to His will. That's what it's all about. It's a means of getting us to consider His will for us. And, and sometimes we fail to do that because we pray selfishly. And we pray at times uh, for our own selfish desires instead of what the you know, infinite, all-wise, omnipotent, omniscient God wants us to pray. And so there are qualifications, again, that give the Christian the right to be heard. He says, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, um, there's a lot of things we can pray for, isn't there? There's a lot of things that perhaps we pray for that we may not know what God's will is. How do we pray for those things? We pray and then we say, not my will, but thy will be done. Right? And there are a lot of things. You, you might say, man, you mean I've got to pray? Everything I pray has got to be according to God's will? That takes all the fun out of it. <laughs> Listen, let me remind you that there are tremendous things that God has in store for us in, within the realm of His will. Within the boundaries and parameters of His will. Amen? Yeah, amen. Tremendous things He has in store for us. Uh, you know, outside the will of God are things that can hurt you and harm you and even destroy you. We don't want to go there. So when we're praying, praying according to His will, we have confidence. If we don't know exactly what the will of God is, we pray. And then we say, not my will, but thine will be done. We add that on the end. Okay, we keep safe. we'll stay safe that way. So when we realize this, we can obviously have this confidence here that John's talking about. And you know, we ought to be praying for things that are according to God's will. Again, uh, I'm reminded of, you know, you go back and study the prayers of Paul. And you're not going to see a lot of, you know, I think 
Right off the top of my head, I, I, I didn't do the study, but right off the top of my head, I would say the only time that I remember God praying, excuse me, Paul praying to God for something concerning himself was when he asked to have that thorn removed, and, and God gave him the answer, my grace is sufficient for thee. All the rest of the time, Paul, you go to Ephesians chapter 1, I think, and in Colossians, pretty close to the same prayer, he, he asked for a, a, a greater knowledge and understanding and having his eyes open to what God wanted him to do. He prayed for enlightenment. Listen, you can't pray out of God's will when you're praying that stuff, can you? That's the, those are the things we ought to be praying for. And we, you know, we pray for, for a lot of folks who are sick physically, and that's fine. Uh, but I'm here to tell you it's not always God's will that we'd be healed. Otherwise, we'd be living forever today. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, uh, verse 16, we'll move on here. Point is, we know this. You know, title of the message, what do you know for sure? We know God hears us. Okay, we know God hears us. And we need to, be, we need to have the confidence and boldness in our prayer by praying according to his will. Now, when we get to verse 16, uh, I was reading some things on this. This is perhaps, one, one guy called this uh, verse perhaps one of the most difficult to interpret in the, in the Bible. I'm going, wow, why did I have to preach this passage? <laughs> uh, well, because it's the next verse, that's why, okay? Um, so I'm not going to be dogmatic on this, okay? I'm not going to pretend I have all the answers. And I'm, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. But I will give you uh, some of what I've studied here and what seems to make sense. In verse 16, it is clear, at least here, that we are to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? That is, that is clear. If any man see his brother's sin, a sin which is unto death, uh, excuse me, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin to death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. All right? Now, so verse 16, again, it's clear that we ought to be praying for others. Um, and we tend, as what we tend, as I said before, to pray for our own needs. We need to be praying for others. We need to be praying for each other here in the body of Christ. Um, and the specific example that John gives here is a, is a prayer of intercession. Um, and so there's a, the implication here, an indication that as Believers, we have a responsibility to intercede on the behalf of others. That ought to be part of our prayer life. And our responsibility is that when we see a brother fall into sin, we ought to be praying for them. Amen? We ought to be praying for them. Not gossiping about the situation, praying for them. We fail miserably here because sometimes it does become a matter of gossip. We want to know what it is that we need to pray for because we want to gossip about it rather than pray about it. Now verse... Again, verse 16 and 17 really are an illustration here of what John has just been saying about praying in God's will. We have an illustration of a request that is perhaps here, or excuse me, is in the will of God. We also have a request that apparently, from what it sounds here, it is not in the will of God. You know, when a, when a brother is involved in sin, uh, I tell you what, let me, let me go to something that I was reading earlier here. Anybody ever heard of a gut, gut questions Dot org. I like to go there. Uh, let's see. Because they give some pretty good answers. I, I've, I, I've been pretty satisfied with a, everything that I've read there. But I was looking to see what they said about this. Here's, here's where I was reading. One of the most difficult verses in the New Testament to interpret uh, this, uh, this passage. Uh, the best interpretation, they say here, may be found by comparing this verse to what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. We know what happened to them, right? Uh, they lied to the Holy Spirit, and uh, they got drug out of the church. Uh, we also know the situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when Paul said that there were many that were abusing the Lord's Supper, and there was, uh, there was uh, folks that slept because of that. In other words, they died because of that. According to 1 Peter 1.16, God has called us to holiness, Right? So when we sin, obviously, <laughs> that puts us in trouble. And uh, God corrects them when they sin. We are not punished for our sin in the sense of losing salvation or being separated from God. Yet we are disciplined because we know according to Hebrews chapter 12, the Lord loves those whom he disciplines. Hey, be glad God disciplines you when you stray. Amen? Amen. Because that means you're saved. 
um, he says, there comes a point when God can no longer allow a believer to continue in unrepentant sin. When that point is reached, God may take the life of the stubbornly sinful believer. The death is, that's referred to here as a physical death. Um, and so the Apostle John here is making this distinction uh, between uh, this uh, sin that leads to death and a sin that does not lead to death. Um, he goes on to say here, I'll just kind of skip down through here. God, in Acts chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 11, I mentioned, he says, God dealt with intentional, calculated sin in the church by taking the physical life of the sinner. He also talked about a man who was uh, uh, having an uh, immoral relationship in 1 Corinthians 5. He talked about the destruction of the flesh. May have been talking about the same thing there. So John is saying that we should pray for Christians who are sinning and that God will hear our prayers. We know that. He goes on to say this, however, there may come a time when God decides to cut short a believer's life due to unrepentant sin. Prayers for such an unheeding person will not be effective. Now that is one way to interpret this passage. Notice what he said, there is a sin, uh, excuse me, if any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not to death, he shall ask and give him life for them that sin not to death. We ought to be praying for that brother or sister who has fallen into sin. But there is a sin to death, and I do not say that he shall pray for it. So, uh, I ask this question, what is, the, what, what is it that turns a sin, because we're all sinners, notice what, he, notice what he said in verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. What is the element, the ingredient, if you will, that turns an ordinary sin into a sin unto death. Well, I would say it's a deliberate, willing disobedience, even when you know it's wrong, when you know what is right, and you say, I don't care what is, what is right, I'm going to do what's wrong, I'm going to continue in that sin. Unrepentant, willful disobedience. If a Christian continues along that pathway, I suppose God could take him home, according to what the Scripture says. Again, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this interpretation, but that seems to, to at least make sense. God has said it's wrong. You know it's wrong, but you're going to do it anyway. You better be careful when you're that, when you're that way. Amen? You better be careful. Uh, John says, I do not say that he shall pray for that. In other words, <laughs> God's mind has been made up. Uh, there's, there's no sense in praying. That prayer is not going to be effective. Now, we can get all wrapped around the axle about that. That's really an exception. That's not the rule, amen? That's an exception, not the rule. That, that is something that I would say is very rare. I would say is very rare. So the point is, God hears our prayer. We know he hears our prayer. Isn't that comforting thought? We know he hears our prayer. You can go to God and pray and he knows, excuse me, and know and have the confidence that he hears you. That's the point. All right? Let's go on. I need that bottle of water. <clears throat> Second point is one that we've already really uh, talked about through this epistle. We know that we're not supposed to practice sin. Duh. Right? We know that we're not supposed to practice sin. Notice what he says, verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and that wicked one touches him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. So we are not to practice sin. We've heard that time and time again in this little epistle already. Um, very similar to what John has already been telling us. And, and the key word here is practice. We all, we all know what John said back in the beginning of the letter. You know, if we say we have no sin, verse uh, 8 of chapter 1, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth's not in us. So we know we're sinners. The key word here is practice. Okay? The present tense. Uh, we don't continually sin. We don't continually practice sin. Or else, if we do, we're putting ourselves back in a situation we just talked about in verses 16. We may be sending that sin unto death, a deliberate, willful rejection uh, of God's word. 
So the key word again is practice. We don't become sinless. However, a person who is truly born again will not deliberately, knowingly, willingly practice sin. At least without not getting beaten up anyways, right? Discipline. Discipline. God's discipline. Certainly not normal for that to happen. And again, it appears that it could happen. There could be that sin unto death that John was talking about. The habitual ones are the ones that should not happen. Okay? Why? Do we not have a new nature? Right? We've been born again. All things have become new. All things have passed away, right? The old man is crucified. Romans chapter 6. You could go there and do a whole series on Romans chapter 6. Sin has no more dominion over us. We, we, as Christians, we should not have to practice sin. We should have new desires and new appetites. We ought to lose interest in sin. I, 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 you know, I think back to when I got saved. My life didn't change overnight. There were some things that lingered on for a while. But after a while, as I began to be faithful in church and began to learn, guess what? I lost interest in some of that stuff. I lost interest in it. Didn't care about it anymore. And that, that's a good thing, amen? That's what ought to be happening. We lose interest in those things. Uh, we see here, notice that he, he kind of makes it sound like he that is begotten of God. This is verse 18. He that is begotten of God keeps himself, and that wicked one touches him not. Um, I think that points to a responsibility that you and I have. Now, we understand it is God who works through us. We understand it's the Holy Spirit who works in us. But there's also a responsibility on our part to keep ourselves, right? To keep ourselves. I think about uh, Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul talks about putting off the old man. We have a responsibility to put away some things and be renewed. And then God helps us put on some new things. Amen? We put on the new, the new man. So the Holy Spirit keeps us from the evil one. It keeps us from his influences. And uh, again... When we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, and we continue to practice sin knowingly, willfully, being disobedient, God's going to discipline us. God's going to discipline us. And, and it is, that is a good thing because that is evidence that the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and that's an evidence, obviously, that you're born again. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. We don't tend to discipline other parents, excuse me, other kids in other families, do we? We tend to just discipline our own, okay? Unless you're the mean old lady on the block, whatever. We tend to discipline our own kids. God's going to discipline his kids if we practice sin. The person may struggle. He may temporarily fall. He may resist the Holy Spirit trying to bring changes. But he won't continually do so. He'll eventually come around if he's born again. I believe that. David. David's a perfect example. You know, we... I often use, use, his, excuse me, use him as an example because he's called a man after God's own heart. And you look back at what he did, and how in the world can he be called a man after God's own heart? Well, Psalm 51 gives us the answer, right? He got it all right with God. He confessed it. He said, God, renew in me a clean spirit. Give me a clean spirit, renew in me a right heart. And he got things right. He didn't continually stay there. That's the, that's the key. Uh, so the one who is dwelling in him, God, will bring him into some circumstances, as he did with David, and some pressures that will bring him back to God. I believe that will happen. And either, you know, make that person come to his senses, just like the guy in the pig pen, right? The prodigal son woke up one day and said, whoa, what am I doing here? He came to his senses. Came to his senses. So... That person that's in that situation, either he's going to straighten up and pay attention to God's discipline, or he puts himself perhaps in the situation where God may take him home. <laughs> I don't know. How is anybody going to know that? There's no way we'd know that, is there? No way we'd know that. When I die, you're not going to know whether I messed up and God took me home or I just died of natural causes. You're never going to know, and I'm not going to tell. <laughs> Listen, John is saying here, 
We know that we are of God. And the whole world lies in wickedness. You know, we do not have to be under the influence of the evil one. Amen? We don't have to be. We have the power to resist him. Uh, the devil doesn't have to make you sin. Don't be like Flip Wilson. The devil made me do it. Don't be like him. No, we have the power to have the victory over sin. I was, uh, wrote down a few verses here that I want to just uh, go to real quick. And you don't have to. You can just listen. I'm going to flip through them here. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. He said this. Who gave himself for our sins. Obviously talked about Jesus. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. According to the will of God and our Father. Uh, Colossians uh, 1.13 Colossians 1.13 says this. <clears throat> Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. And he has translated us in the kingdom of his dear son. We are of God. We are of God. He has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Uh, let's see another one in Romans chapter 6 verse 14. Uh, he says this. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Uh, back over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he said this, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. <laughs> Next verse uh, says, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Listen, aren't you glad you're of God? The whole world lies in the grip of the evil one, but we are of God, and we have, can have confidence and assurance of that fact. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. The whole world lies in wickedness. Look around us. Look around us. The whole world lies in wickedness, and, they, and they, don't, they don't see it. We know. We know. We know. So, as John wraps up this epistle here, obviously we know we have eternal life. We know God hears us. We know we're not supposed to be practicing sin. Last point is this. We know this is the real life. We know this is reality. This is reality. Listen, the Christian walk is reality. <laughs> Notice what he says. We know, verse 20, that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So keep yourselves from idols. Amen. We have a certainty here. It is a certainty of reality. We know we have the real life. You know, it reminds me, uh, when we go to, uh, when we head north sometimes, we go to Macon and we take... Uh, 129 up through Gray and Eatonton. There's a church outside of Macon. It's called the Real Life Church. It's a pretty big, big church. I, I remember it because it's pretty good size and it's a different name. It's called the Real Life Church. I often wonder what they, what they teach you, teach there. Hopefully, it's good. But listen, we're at in Sophia. It doesn't rest on clever ideas or untested theories. It rests on facts of history. God's actions in history. Jesus Christ is the true God. John has been hammering that home to us here through this epistle. We know him is true. We know, we know we are in him who is true. We have, listen, Coke don't have the real thing. We got the real thing. Amen? Amen. <laughs> we know the Son of God has come into history. It's a historical fact. And he's given us a new understanding. I, I, I like what he says here. He has given us an understanding. Don't you think that as Christians, as we get into the Word of God and we have the indwelling Holy Spirit in us, we have an understanding that the rest of the world who lies in wickedness does not have? Thank God for it. I remember after I first got saved, I went to Fenway Park to see the 
sorry, Bull Sox. They were sorry this year. Uh, but anyways, there was about, I don't know, 30,000 people there, I guess. They sat seated there at that time. And, and I remember I'd just gotten saved. And I remember looking out at thousands of people and going, man, these people don't know what I do. Most, most of them don't know what I, what I know now. God had given me an understanding, <laughs> an understanding. We know, we know, we know that you may know. It's so important. Notice, uh, well, where, is it? where was it? Back in uh, verse um, chapter 2 and verse 20, he said, you know, when he was talking about these folks that went out from them because they were not of us, if they'd been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out. He says to the, his readers, but you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. You have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. What a, listen, it is a tremendous privilege, and I hope you appreciate it, for you and I to have the privilege of knowing Christ. Amen. And having this understanding that's been given to us, that we've been chosen, if you will, okay? What a tremendous privilege it is to think that we know Christ. Think about the foundational, fundamental truths that we know. It changes our whole outlook on life. That's why we, I look at myself so much different from, from uh, you know, what, I, what I'll call them the liberals who, who don't think like I think. and don't see the world through the same lens that I see the world through. Because God has given me an understanding. He's given me an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true. What a tremendous privilege we have. You better count it a privilege that you're able to sit in a pew and hear God's teaching, amen? amen. Have copies of the scriptures, be in a good Bible preaching church. Amen. We see things from a whole different perspective than the world does. I was, uh, I think I mentioned this to some guys in the Sunday school class this morning. I was listening to Fox News, and they had these voters on there. They had three or four voters. Who are you voting for? Why? This, this one lady went on and on about uh, all, all the normal talking points about Trump that are most, mostly lies. Uh, but they continue with them anyways. And she said, I'm, I'm tired of seeing babies in cages. And I went, are you kidding me? You're tired of seeing babies in cages? But you're not tired of babies being killed in the womb? Amen. Hello. I'm one, I want to reach the TV and ring that her lady's name. Listen, we have been given an understanding that gives us a spiritual godly perspective. Tremendous, tremendous privilege. Jesus Christ is the real thing. He is the real thing. And we know it. And he closes this letter by reminding us, we know the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we're in him that is true. And then he closes there with that little verse, given that fact, keep yourselves from idols. And in other words, keep yourselves from anything that would take the place of Jesus Christ, who we know is true. If he's given, us you, if, uh, excuse me, if he's given you an understanding, you're not going to be wor uh, worshiping idols. You're not going to be letting anything else get in the way, kicking Jesus off the throne of your heart, if you will, and putting that, whatever that is, on there. Keep yourselves from idols. I guess I would ask the question, what is it we live for? You know, every once in a while I have to sit back, because I'm like a lot of us, we're busy in our routines of life, and we've got to do this, and we've got to do this, and we've got to do that, and, and every once in a while I sit back and think, what for? You ever get there? What for? It's all going to get burned up anyway. Lord, just come back today. <laughs> it's the real thing. What are we living for? Is it Christ or is it something else? Ask yourself these questions. What makes you enthusiastic? What do you give your money to? What are you saving up for? What is it that you regard as supremely important? If God has truly given us an understanding here that we may know him that is true, listen, we'll put our focus on Jesus Christ. I am glad that we have a faith, I guess I'll call it, I was going to say religion, but we have a faith where we can know these things are true. 
I, I think about a verse, let's see, where is that? Uh, and I'll close with this, if I can remember where it is. I believe it's uh, Philippians 1.6. It says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We can be confident. <laughs> Listen, we know we have eternal life. We know God hears us. We know we're not supposed to practice sin. We know we're supposed to keep the commandments. We know we have an understanding. We have a different perspective on on the world because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, because of the understanding that we have, the unction that we have from God. What a tremendous privilege we have. Amen? Let's stand together. I think I saw that the uh, invitation song was Be Thou My Vision. That is a very fitting song for this. I pray God will be our vision, right? He would be our vision. And He can be. When we know He hears us, when we, you know, when we know that uh, we're supposed to be keeping His commandments, avoiding sin, we have this understanding He should be our vision. And he's got to be our vision for these things to be true. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the Word of God tonight. Lord, I'm thankful that You've given us the ability, the privilege uh, Lord, uh, through the, the Word, through the Holy Spirit's presence in us, Lord, that we might know these things and that we might be confident, not because of our abilities, not because of anything we've done, but all because of what you've done. Lord, for that, we are truly thankful tonight. I pray, God, if there's one here tonight that's not sure, that they do not know that they have eternal life, Lord, speak to that heart tonight. Father, I pray that they might know the Lord Jesus Christ as their, uh, as their Savior before they walk out of this place. Father, for the Christian who perhaps has been maybe doubtful, maybe some things in the life that uh, has caused concern and worry, Lord, it's good that we know. We know these things. We know you hear us when we pray. Lord, we know that Jesus is the real thing. So, Father, I pray for your, for this invitation time, Lord, that we'd be obedient to the urgings and the promptings of the Holy Spirit in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.